Sanvonani, we have a part two of insolvency law, Department of Mercantile Law. We dealt with question one last, so today we are going to deal with question two of the check, right? Which is part two. Uh, it says the Pretoria High Court has given a judgment of 30,000 against Peter in favor of Jack. Upon the demand of the officer whose duty to execute the judgment, Peter fails to satisfy it and also fails to indicate to the officer disposable property sufficient to satisfy the judgment. The return made by the officer stated that he has not found sufficient disposable property to satisfy the judgment. Explain to Jack what the implications of the Afro mentioned facts may be. So here you are looking for the implications. So let me summarize. Let me summarize it for you. It, it, uh, the, the scenario is about the Peter who is owing Jack eighty thousand, and then he fails to to prove that he will pay to Jack. Then we uh, you are explain to Jack the implications. Right. Therefore, the firstly, you will need the Insolvency Act of 24, 24 of 1936. Then we'll go and read Section 8 of the Insolvent Act, uh, how the debtor commit an insolvency. Then according to Section 8, uh, paragraph B, a debtor commits an insolvency if a court has given judgment against him and he fails upon the demand of the officer whose duty to execute the ju that judgment to satisfy it or to indicate to that officer disposable property sufficient to satisfy it, or if it appears the return made by the officer that he has not found sufficient disposable property to satisfy the judgment. So here it's like a you have gone to court, and uh, uh, it's a civil matter between you and SARS. Then SARS, you are owing maybe SARS uh, 40,000. Then the, the, the judgment will work in favor of the SARS, that you must pay 40,000. And when now the officer who has to execute that judgment uh, comes to you looking for the 40,000, you fail to give 40,000, and you fail to provide an, an asset that is worthy for two thousand. So what now SARS must do? That is what the question is about. So here it means that you have committed an act of insolvency in terms of section eight, paragraph B. And you must also read other uh, 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 paragraph also because A to G talks about the uh, the, the, the the insolvency of a debtor. It's very crucial that you understand this uh, section because you will be working through uh, working it through. Now, in order to answer the the question, we have to give the background of a, a insolvency act. They said the primary objective of the insolvency act is not to grant relief to the debtor. Say this down. It's not to grant relief to the debtor. This was stated in the case of R. Visas Mier, where the court stated that the Insolvency Act was passed for the benefit of creditors and not for the relief of harassed debtor. Further, in Section 6 and Section 10 of the Insolvency Act, one of the requirements must be met in order for the debtor's estate to be sequestrated is that it must be to the advantage of creditors. This South African insolvency law is very creditor orientated. <laughs> uh, the debtor himself, he may apply to the court for the voluntary surrender. This is the first implication. Uh, Peter may apply to the court for voluntary surrender of his estate. Or uh, Jack, as a creditor, or other creditors may apply to court for compulsory sequestration of the debtor's estate. So there are implications here. The purpose of the sequestration order is to secure an equitable distribution in a predetermined order of the debtor's assets among all of creditors. Section 8 of the Insolvency Act provides for acts of insolvency which one committed by the debtor entitles the creditor to apply for the credit compulsory sequestration of debtor's estate without proving 
actually insolvency. Then here is section 8, which deals with that one that we were reading. And now there is a, 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 a implication that has been uh, outlined here, which is compulsory sequestration. That's why we have to re go and read about compulsory sequestration. Before we read about a, a voluntary sequestration, you must know that the voluntary surrender is done through Section 3, Subsection 1 of the Insolvency Act, and where the, the where Peter can apply to court for acceptance of the surrender of his estate. Uh, section 6 of Section 1 of the Insolvency Act provides the requirement or procedure on how is the application is done. Okay? I was just giving you so that you can note then on the other side, you must know that uh, compulsory sequestration is done uh, through Section 9, which is a petition for sequestration of estate, and then it's done based on Section number, uh, section, subsection 1. And it's the compulsory sequestration read as follows. Section 9, subsection 1 of the Insolvency Act provides that a creditor or his agent may apply to the court to have the debtor's estate sequestrated. The court must be satisfied that an applicant has established a claim which is in terms of Section 9 of the Insolvent Act entitles him to do so. The debtor has committed an act of insolvency based on Section 8. There is a reason to believe that the sequestration will be to the advantage of creditors. You must also note down that in a compulsory sequestration, Jack bears the owner to satisfy the court that the requirements are met. So he has to prove that Section 8 is met. The yeah, Peter has met Section 8. The court must be satisfied that there is a reason to believe that the sequestration will be to the advantage of Jack. It must be shown that the creditors are actually going to get some money from the sequestration or not just a negligible dividend. In a case of compulsory sequestration, the sequestrating creditor will have to appear before the court twice. In the first instance, the sequestrating creditor will have to apply for a provisional order for sequestration in terms of Section 10 of the insolvent. For a provisional order, a prima facie case must be established. The purpose of the second appearance before the court is to have the provisional order confirmed and made final in terms of Section 12 of the insolvent. For final order, proof is required on balance of probability. Besides the implication of a compulsory uh, sequestration, we have what we, is known as a friendly sequestration. We have a compulsory sequestration. We have, only, we, we have another one, which is a friendly sequestration. Don't forget this. It has become a practice a common practice for debtors to arrange with a family member or a friend to whom he owes money to have his estate sequestrated. Commonly, both parties may agree that the debtor will write a letter indicating that he cannot meet his financial obligations with respect to the debt owed, and as such, the other person will then apply for the sequestration of the debtor's estate on the basis that the debtor committed an act of insolvency. It has been stated that friendly sequestrations are not illegal in nature, but nevertheless open the door for collusion and other malpractices, and that that courts are wary of this. Then they provide the case of Mtumkulu, Peter Rampart, where the court described the manner in which sequestration procedure may be abused. From the judgment, it is evident that the friendly sequestration are often brought with the aim of obtaining a stay in a civil proceedings and stay of a stay, sale in execution. The debtor resorts to friendly sequestration instead of voluntary surrender because it may be obtained on an urgent basis without having to satisfy the preliminary requirements or giving creditors notice. Let's also put the consequences of sequestration. What happened uh, during the sequestration? It means that Peter, according to Section 23, Subsection 3, during the sequestration of the office, he state, will not, uh, without the trustee written consent, carry on or be employed in the capacity or any direct or indirect interest in the business of the trade. 
Number two is that upon the sequestration of Peter's uh, estate, the insolvent is disqualified. He is disqualified from holding various positions. Another one is that in terms of Section 58, Paragraph A, uh, the insolvent will be required to vacate his position. So Peter will be required to vacate his position. This is uh, the implications. These are the consequences of a sequestration. We are going. Another thing you must take a note is that in the case of DB Duplessis Procurance v. Arda, the court stated that the debtor's estate may be sequestrated even if he is theoretical solvent. This means that it do, it does not, uh, the, the creditor does not have to prove uh, the requirements of Section 8, which we are client but he can be sequestrated theoretically. This is based on the case of DP to places. You must note down this uh, uh, a case so that even if you get a scenario which talks about uh, the, the, the insolvency of the uh, debtor, you will be knowing about this. Another thing that I want you to take note is that there's a question which was asked, does an application for compulsory, application for compulsory sequestration amount to an enforcement of a credit, credit agreement? Uh, they said for one to have an understanding of whether an ap application for compulsory sequestration will amount to an enforcement, enforcement of credit agreement, it is important to consider the case of investment V. Mutemeri, V. Uh, APSA Bank, and the reason provided by the court. Uh, so, the, we go down here at the case, uh, which uh, I believe that I will deal with you uh, when you are writing the portfolios, if you are still writing portfolios, or maybe I will teach you about it one time so that you are able to understand, because you may get a question about this one. Uh, I was just highlighting. Okay, guys, we have done so much about that first match. We have uh, uh, explained the implications where there was a voluntary and there was a compulsory, and then there was a friendly sequestration, which we have explained all of them. It's up to you to summarize them. And sorry, I didn't use the, the, the prescribed book of you. Remember, when you are, you are doing LLB, you have to seek knowledge from different sources. And unfortunately, I just uh, use that source uh, because it has more uh, information than relying on the book. So it doesn't mean that you must not refer to the prescribed book, but you must also seek more knowledge in order for you to understand. As an LLB, you must read books, you must read our journal articles, you must do more research in order for you to understand so that you have a broader knowledge when you answer each and every question. Uh, that right is for today, and then thanks very much, uh, guys, for watching. That was part two of a uh, Law of Insolvency.